Fire impacts people in a number of ways. Obviously, number one, from a health perspective or physical perspective, people die in fires. People are gravely injured in fires and take a long amount of time to recover, either from burns, they suffer from actual contact with the fire or from inhalation of the smoke and the toxic gases that are created when something burns. The most devastating thing is after the fact, after a fire, how it affects the families and depending on how large the fire might be and where they're going to live and a lot of the things in a home cannot be replaced. Well, sometimes it's old pictures and uh, all sorts of things that have a lot of precious memory to people. So we try to protect them as much as we can. It's uh, sometimes impossible, but if we can, can we do? The year 1871 was the driest year that Lansing ever had. On Sunday, October 8th at 2 p.m., a spark from a locomotive on the Panhandle Railroad caused the marsh to catch fire at the south end, east of the Panhandle Railroad, and with a strong south wind, it burned the entire marsh. My father was conducting a meeting in the Little Lansing Church when the fire was reported. He at once dismissed the meeting, and the farmers all rushed home to plow fire breaks around their homes. They plowed all afternoon and far into the night to head off that tremendous swamp fire. The marsh burned for about six days and cleaned up everything east of the Panhandle Railroad, a territory about three miles wide and six miles long. Initially, there were three separate areas of town, kind of like neighborhoods, and each one had some form, established some form of fire protection. One was called Bernice, which was along the Bernice Road area. And then the area along Torrance Avenue was known as Oak Glen, and then Lansing proper, which would be the, the old uptown business area and the houses that surrounded it, that area. And uh, Winterhall from the bottom store, and uh, it was on a pipe. For about 10 people to pull it out there. But normally it was any depot. People had buckets of water, one bucket, and then the waiting room had sand in, and the other had water in. And about above that was stretches in case the railroad went over somebody. We had railroads with steam engines yet, and uh, they'd, they'd drop spark and start the prairies on fire. Or if the spark didn't do it, the railroad men would throw a fusee into the prairies when they were done with it. And we'd end up with a pretty good prairie fire. Back in those days, it was prairie fires that they put up with mostly, prairie fires and so on and so forth. Uh, and if, unfortunately, a home would catch fire, uh, they'd have to deal with it accordingly, like with buckets, but basically prairie fires and barn fires and such, things like that. In the summertime, they had to be quite active to protect the property and not worry about the prairie, but protect the property around the prairie. I mean, we had some pretty big prairies. Was, got the wind of them, that really took off. Now we don't even know what a prairie fire is predominantly a farming community. Uh, very simply, as in any area that develops, if there's no organized fire protection, someone's house catches fire, it's, it's just a, a mad dash effort of whoever's close to try and help put it out. In those days, it was the, the bucket brigade, or whatever people had available. Uh, usually after one or two significant losses like that, the movement generates in the community to create an organized fire department to deal with these things. Winterhoff, he started the fire department July 1922. William Winterhoff, he was a local Ford dealer. He donated a flatbed truck that a water tank and some hose was mounted on and uh, became the first fire chief of the village. He drummed up all the merchants he could that were wanted to be active and formed a fire department in 1922. And they had their training every week. They'd come and practice how to hold a fire nozzle and uh, how to 
drive the truck they had. They were pretty proficient with the equipment they had. Man, there were over 50 of them that started. It didn't take but two months. They were down, down to about 20 or 25. Well, I think the main, the main reason for dropping out was the fact that they, they thought it was uh, strictly for amusement, not work. You know, they thought it was a social thing. Because a lot of people thought firefighting was joy. We were here to meet the men and have fun. But it turned out when they started to burn their clothes and a few other things that uh, there was no joy for some of them. Most of the men that belonged to the fire department back then were all businessmen who were located right near the firehouse. They could leave their jobs of being merchants and come here and become firefighters by getting to the fire and putting the fire out. Strictly volunteer and there was no pay involved at those, in those days at all. It was strictly a volunteer fire department. Fire department first become paid. There were some people that were not totally in favor of it. They wanted to stay totally paid or paid on call fire department. They called them volunteer but they still paid on call. But we had to go paid because we just did not have anybody respond to the fire calls. Like a lot of other departments, we were seeing a decline in the number of paid on call people who were available during the daytime hours. In 1970 is when uh, Ralph Schauer took on. He was the first full-time firefighter. And shortly after that, additional firefighters were hired. The original fire station was located where the old police station is now at 3404 Lake Street. Uh, what is currently the fire station was not the original one. There was a, a one bay area on the west side of the building and when the fire department grew the, the part was built on the east side of that building which is there now which is fire station one. When I come on, it was Station 1 and Station 2, and uh, they both operated together. Station 3 mainly was for the people on the south side of town that divided us by the railroad tracks. It enabled us to answer fire calls, you know, if we had a train and was blocked before, we was able to now get on that side of town. Station 4 was mainly built for the industrial area and the landings. In the days when the fire department first started, there wasn't any such thing as protective clothing. People fought it in their street clothes. Basically, they fought fires in blue jeans and t-shirts and so on. And as time moved on, uh, they were wearing the old rubber coats and rubber boots and, and helmets and stuff like that. It progressed into that. Uh, slowly it evolved to what was the long-standing tradition, which was a long rubber coat and pull-up rubber boots, which was primarily designed to keep the water off of the firefighter. It had no real value in protecting him against heat radiated from the fire. You sort of took a breath and you dove in and you did what you could and you'd get out. And, and then we went into the Chemox, which was a, a antiquated piece of mining equipment, actually, with a canister. We had a, what they call a Chemox, mask that you had to breathe into, self-breathing mask, which is not very beneficial. Uh, when I first started the fire department, we had very few SCBAs. Nowadays, with the plastics and the, and the chemicals that are in your house, in, in, in the building, it's uh, so much more important, and it's great that we have these advanced uh, breathing apparatus. One of the biggest advantages I've seen is not so much in fire, but rescue work. When I first started back in the 70s, we had crowbars and hand-operated hydraulic tools. And we were one of the first ones in the state of Illinois to come out with the Jaws of Life, which is a major advancement, where it used to take us a half hour to hour to get a car door open and get people out. We could do now in just a couple minutes' time. It's a hydraulic rescue tool that is capable of exerting 10,000 pounds of force to spread, for example, metal apart on a car where someone's trapped. Our first unit came to us in 1972 through the Lansing Lions and was donated. 
at the time. We had one and the city of Chicago had one and they were the only two in Cook County. The IC tracks had an accident and Chicago Fire Department lost their only jaws, whether it be a hydraulic problem or whatever. And we heard about it and so we sent a crew to Chicago. In fact, our, our firefighters are the ones that got the engineer out and many of the people out of that IC track uh, wreck. And, uh, many more explications that it's been used on. It saves a lot of lives. In the very beginnings of the fire department, if the emergency number was dialed, it rang into what was then the small telephone office in town, and the operator on duty would call the firefighters literally individually by phone. One of our sirens was on top of Indian Avenue School. So occasionally, if we had a fire while well, within morning, Sunday morning church service, the preacher would stop preaching and they'd look at me when the siren blew and I'd have to barrel out the back and head for the station. When I came on, uh, it started off with the sirens and after the sirens, uh, uh, that pretty much wasn't reliable. Before, when you, this is siren, you'd come here, you still didn't know where you were going. You knew you were going someplace because the siren was blowing, but you had no idea. So then you had a get the rig ready to go and then find out where you were going. You had no pre-warning. You didn't know if it was a grass fire, or house fire, or what it was. They came out, we were on the phone system. A person would call on a fire to the police department. They'd activate, uh, say, 50 phones all at the same time. They'd give us the address, location, the type of fire that we were uh, going to. If it was a grass fire, or for a house fire, or garage fire, or vehicle fire, you had a, you had a heads up on on uh, what was ahead of you, and it, it helped tremendously. And that went on until 1978 when we converted to the radio paging system that we use nowadays. So as you can see, as time went on, we went from the siren on top of this building to the telephone system, to the radio system, and now it's the pager system, which is directed by the by the police department uh, radio system. Well, the flatbed truck was sold for a pumper. That was in turn traded in 1935 for a Chevrolet chassis general pumper, which is the antique vehicle that we have today. When you took this Chevy down the road, you had to keep it in first gear until you got over to Winterhouse Realty Office over there, then you threw it into second, and you kept it in the second until way past Burnham Avenue. By the time you hit Torrance Avenue, you better slow down because you only had mechanical brakes with 500 gallons of live water on that truck with no baffles in the tanks. It's just like uh, driving a, a cattle truck. And something went wrong with a fire rig, we had to have it ready almost immediately. So a lot of our men would jump right in and work all night till it was fixed. Well, you only had one or two pieces of equipment, so you couldn't have them down. <laughs> you had to get them back in service or you'd be without. <laughs> That's all we had. When this truck rolled, put out 85 to 90% of our fires. traded in sometime in 62, was traded in, uh, and we got that rig back. The association purchased the rig back, and uh, all the firefighters worked on it and got it back in the condition where we use it basically for parades and uh, for public education, giving children rides on it and stuff, but it stands tall. Uh, following that in 1947 was a, another an American La France 1,000 gallon a minute pumper. Uh, in 54, another American La France. In 1958, a, a American fire apparatus 750, 750 gallon in a pumper. Um, in 1962 was the first pumper we had that had an aerial ladder attached to it. That was a 75 foot aerial. Our first diesel powered pumper, that was a Mac. And then in 1973 and 75, additional pumpers followed.
1980, we bought a 100-foot aerial ladder with a pump on it. 1987, we had a GMC conventional cab pumper, which is still in service. 1990, we had a, a Ford chassis pumper with a 55-foot, they call it a telescore. It's like a short version of an aerial ladder with a nozzle attached. 1992, we bought a heavy-duty rescue unit, carry specialized tools, breathing air, extra lighting, and, and equipment that uh, is not normally carried on a regular fire pumper. So we've had some major fires over the years. that we had about 30 stills in this town at one time. Why, that, that were most of our fires them days, is the stills blowing up. If you start messing around there, you'd be out there laying in the middle of the road there with about 100 holes in you. <laughs> I'm sure just like every community, there had to be some somewhere, and they occasionally were known to get out of control and blow up, and that usually took care of whatever building they were being hit in at the time. The tanker that burned under the Torrance Avenue Expressway. Early on Sunday morning, a, a car stalled right by the, underneath the uh, viaduct and a tank truck full of gasoline hit the car and then hit the bottom of the viaduct and exploded and was burning underneath the viaduct. It melted the beams. That fire took 49 hours to put out. There was the a, fire was so hot that the big three foot beams that hold it up were like figure S's. They were scorched that bad. Also about that same period of time was when we had the plane crash that involving Tony Lima, the professional golfer who crashed into the lake at the country club. Entire town in 1989 was, was a major fire for us. The tire place on Bernice Road, tire town. That one took quite a while to put out. Tire Town was probably one of the largest, hottest, other than uh, River, uh, River Edge Apartments. Uh, but Tire Town was a hot fire. It, it looked like a tornado. Uh, they had some combustibles in there, a tank. A spark from the welding torch went over, hit it, ignited it. He tried to fight the fire himself, like some people try to do, rather than just get out and it had a head, a real big head start on us. And of course, then when that barrel went off, it set the whole shop on fire. And with a lot of tires in there and uh, different types of chemicals and so on and so forth, it was uh, quite an ordeal. I was told that we drained Luna Lake down one third. We're, that was our main water source, was the lake there that we drafted off of. At that time, I believe we had like 15 to 18 fire departments respond, and we fought the fire all night long. But we did cut it off. We saved part of that building, but we had a lot of explosions, and, and so that was probably one of the largest ones that I've been involved in. In 1976, when we created the paramedic program, that was a massive fundraising effort. Uh, we started out with a goal of $80,000 and raised over a hundred to put the people through the necessary training, buy the ambulances and all the equipment required to become a paramedic level agency. We went door to door, asked people to donate at least $7 to help us get started. We had dances, uh, many other different benefits, group drives, a lot of different activities to get the paramedic program started. We have four ambulances. They could be used simultaneously because people get sick at unknown times. And it's not rare either that they're not all used at the same time. You commit a substantial amount of people and resources to doing it, but it's also one of the most respected areas for a fire department to take part in because you're dealing one-on-one -on -one with people I would have to say 80% of our work is EMS. Um, but then we always can't, we can never let our guard down for fire suppression or any other emergencies that we might have. We've taken on a number of other responsibilities, emergency medical being, the, being one of them. And any town that does their own emergency medical operation usually runs three medical calls to any fire-related response. 
Uh, obviously, we've been involved in, in rescue as far as accidents on the expressway or in town where people are trapped in cars for years. When we had the, the big floods, we were pumping out people's basements and helping people get out of homes. Uh, anytime there's a tornado, naturally we search for people and help people rebuild to get back into uh, proper living conditions and finding places to live. And if necessary, we can call our neighboring towns to send men to help us. Back when I started in the 70s, we were pretty much alone. When we had a fire, we answered the fire. Today, automatically, we have Munster and Cayman City and Linwood respond to town. On the, just like the recent fire we had at Edgewood, we had, a, I think, 11 or 12 fire departments responding on mutual aid calls. And it's a great help. Now we could get 100 men to do what we used to do with 10 or 20 men. The pumper of today, with the advances and the, the technology that's on board, couldn't have even been, been dreamt of when the fire department first started. The protective clothing offers so much uh, higher level of protection for the firefighters. The equipment that we use has been made considerably lighter weight and more efficient, so it eases the burden of the firefighter. Firefighting today is more technical, more science is included in it. The equipment itself has been upgraded to the best of anybody's ability. Today we have foam mixed with water, which does a better job of, ex of extinguishing. A lot more homes are saved today and a lot of lives are saved today that wouldn't have been saved quite a few years back. Our new 106 has got uh, different foam setups on it and it's just come a long way. I think Lansing's been one of the leaders in the fire service. Uh, we was like I mentioned before, we was one of the first ones to get the jaws of life. Um, uh, first one in this area to have a good training area. Um, we now have a dive team and women's auxiliary and uh, fire cadets, public education. We have a lot of programs and I feel that we're one of the leading ones in the communities. Back in 1959, some of the people built a device called the House of Hazards, which looked like a gigantic dollhouse. And that was used to create fire and little mini fire and smoke scenes so people could understand how the things that they would do in the course of their normal day could possibly cause a fire. We do a number of programs for the, the kids and the schools. We do programs for seniors. We have a little robot that looks like a fire hydrant called Pluggy, which is a, a big hit with the kids. The newest up and coming fire prevention tool is our new mascot, Smokey, the dog who we saved from the pet store fire and who the owner graciously donated to us. And Smokey's gonna learn how to teach the kids to stop, drop, and roll. He's already a big hit with the youngsters and the old folks alike. We put smoke detectors in senior citizen homes and handicapped homes and we maintain it every year. We have the safety trailer, pluggy, uh, beautiful fire prevention activities. Uh, Lansing was very successful in the MDA drive. They collected the most money in the state of Illinois. I believe once or twice in a row. Fundraising we've been doing lately has either been for charitable causes like muscular dystrophy or for the, uh, the widows and orphans of 9-11. We raised a significant amount of money between ourselves and the police department and was presented out there and to help the families, the lost firefighters and police officers on 9-11. We personally, seven of us, took that money to New York City and gave it to the Emerald Society and made sure that money went to the, the needy families. I would also like to thank the, the firefighters from Lansing, Illinois, for coming here and, uh, like many of the firefighters from throughout the country, supporting us, supporting our families. I've done a lot of work with the families and I know they appreciate everything that's come in from all around this nation. And uh, God bless them and God bless America. Thank you. Our big fundraising project right now is we want to create a memorial in town that will recognize all of the former firefighters who passed away. We're fortunate we've never actually lost one in the line of duty, but there's many gentlemen who gave years and years of their time to this department who have passed on, and we want to see that they are recognized as well, and that's, that's what we're working on raising funds for now. 
but you have to have the love of firefighting to go into it because it is a dangerous job. When you become a part of a fire department, you gain a second family. People would have to work in the, in the situations that firefighters do where you literally rely on one another for your own safety. It also helps build a probably a tighter bond than the, the normal business environment. Something gets in your blood. Uh, it's just something you have to do. I've been doing it since 1961. Our job is a challenging job. There's no two types of fires the same. No extrications are the same. It's a very self-rewarding type job too. Get your paycheck uh, every two weeks, but nothing is like payday is when you've done a good job. And that spills over into the families. People, uh, if someone has a problem in their family or needs a help with project, everybody jumps in and helps one another out. And, uh, they're there if they have sad times and they're there to help them celebrate the glad times. It's just part of the, the brotherhood, like you said, of, of being a firefighter. That's what makes it nice for living in this town because everybody does pull together especially my firefighters.